Welcome to The Freedom Factor. I'm your host, Oliver Bardwell. And for this special episode of This Week at the Capitol, we have Representative Jeff Shipley. Jeff's amazing. Um, He is a freedom fighter, and he is unapologetic in his pursuit of freedom for every one of his constituents and every Iowan. So how are you doing, Jeff? How's your... I'm doing doing great, Oliver. It's uh, always uh, a privilege to be with you. And... um... And yeah, just be involved in these conversations. I think we're coming off a pretty successful uh, Thursday night Moms for Liberty panel. And then tomorrow on Monday uh, at 5 p.m., we'll be uh, doing our first government oversight hearing from uh, several different mothers who've been affected by obscene literature in their schools. And uh, so I think it's a really uh, great opportunity to get to the bottom of some of these issues and keep making progress. Yeah, I think you have some great parents lined up to be on that panel that have been really fighting for to get the obscenity out of these uh, schools. And yeah, I, and I, I think, you know, we're still trying to kind of piece together, um, you know, where this is really coming from upstream and who's really kind of defending this stuff and kind of. Um, but thankfully, I, I think we've got a pretty clear idea of how to reform the process or at least how the current process isn't working or that the law needs to be completely overhauled because um, this this exemption for educational institutions for obscene material just doesn't really make much sense. Um, and so I think we're going to I think we're going to find that out here in the in the days and weeks ahead. For sure. What's your ideas on remedying that and improving it? So uh, right now there is a definition of obscene material in Iowa code. Uh, but the problem is it just exempts educational institutions and libraries across the board. So I think um, it would be as simple as just clarifying an exemption just for higher educational institutions um, or maybe just deleting that section. So, yeah, it's already there's already laws around distributing obscene materials to minors. Um, Obviously, you know, no one's been really activating or pursuing those laws or prosecuting that. Um, It's interesting because also the definition of obscene material is contingent on the uh, scientific, literary, artistic or political value of the work taken as a whole. So certainly, you know, for a lot of these works, um, you know, there there may be an argument for it has political value on, you know, gender identity or whatever. Um, So, I mean, it's just a very, very interesting conversation because obviously free expression and, you know, academic freedom is very important. Uh, but some of these books are just kind of plain and poor taste. And I think what we're trying to figure out is what the heck is even the claimed educational value of some of these materials. So I think the plan is to hear from parents and then hopefully that uh, sparks a conversation and we'll be able to uh, hear from the librarians or uh, this, you know, the school boards or districts that have been defending this. Um, but I think there's broad consensus that the entire process needs to be overhauled um, and really investigated. Yeah. And, and for any of you who aren't completely aware of what's going on, I mean, we're talking about obscene material, a material that I couldn't share right now on the podcast because it would get removed from Facebook or Google or, or, uh, yeah, I think, I think the most egregious thing that I've come across is, um, a book that felt the need to go into the nerve endings of the anus and then, you know, the proper way to stimulate those nerve endings. Um, so there is some pretty just kind of indefensible stuff, um, that really does not belong in schools. Um, another kind of dividing line that I have when I approach the issue is kind of fiction versus nonfiction. Um, cause the other side will, you know, if you ask them, why does a kid need to be exposed to, you know, teenage prostitution and drug use or, or child molestation or, or some of these really graphic um, topics? I said, oh, well, you know, kids need to recognize their privilege and realize these things exist. I said, okay, then why are you using a fictionalized account, right? I mean, there's plenty of nonfiction true stories um, that, you know, when it is a person telling their own story, they often don't feel the need to go into explicit graphic detail in the writing. Anyway, the whole thing's very perverse and frankly, uh, uncomfortable. Uh, but at least, you know, anyway, we're having a meeting tomorrow night. So say your prayers for us. 
Yes, we will for sure. I'll be commenting on the bill as well, and we'll be supporting you guys and the parents that are speaking. I know Terry Patrick's going to be speaking, and she wrote an incredible blog post for us that uh, outlined the ALA, and they put together that lookbook, which really gave us some graphic yes. insight. Well, and so I think really I'm just so pleased and optimistic because I think we're really seeing representative government um, operate where we have these wonderful parents. I think Terry has been um, a frontline leader and a hero in a lot of ways for just throwing herself up into the the gears of you know these complaint processes and these various. And, and I think that's the main thing I do wish to convey. Um, it really is invaluable when people exhaust all their available remedies to address a problem. It really does help. Uh, put it at the top of the legislative list and really clarify that there's a problem in the process. And again, the only way we can know that is when is when citizens, you know, uh, get chewed up and spit out, so to speak. So that's um, been really, really helpful uh, driving the legislative process. And then it's been so great because I think we are really just taking, um, and I'll use your blog post for an example, you know, the work that you guys did on KSOL and SEL and, and really just the deep dive um, and obviously it goes much deeper, but just, you know, scratching at this and really kind of explaining what you're seeing, what your problems are with it and, uh, backing up with research. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're hoping to do is just copy and paste what you guys are saying and put that into Iowa code. For sure. Yeah. And we appreciate that. We appreciate how, how much our representatives have, have listened in this past year and you can see it coming out in the legislation and, and everything that you guys are doing at the Capitol. Yeah, um, obviously that's just one of, of a lot of different subjects that we have going on. Um, but another thing, I kind of brought this up. Um, I'm excited. We've been having good conversations about school nutrition. So I think there'll be a handful of uh, proposals around there. Actually, I talked to a clinical nutritionist after uh, the panel on Thursday who uh, was very helpful. And, and again, so... Um, yeah, we need all the help we can get and your participation matters. And I think we're coming a long way, but we're still just kind of getting getting our feet underneath ourselves and hopefully can actually exercise power and, and get and get better government here. So um uh, what else do you see coming up this week that people should be on the lookout for? Well, I one of the things I'm working on, so there's the Second Amendment Preservation Act. Um, and this is legislation that I think uh basically it says um, the state of Iowa law enforcement will only enforce Iowa law and that we're not going to comply with uh, federal mandates, rules, or even federal laws that conflict with our Second Amendment rights. So the Second Amendment is, uh, you know, a state constitutional right now. And um, what the Joe, what the Biden administration is doing is they're implementing new rules on pistol braces um, is, is what they're targeting right now. And, and basically that'll turn turn people into felons who fail to register these stabilizing devices. So, um, you know, one of the things we talked about the other night uh, at the school thing was, you know, basically divorcing ourselves from the federal government. Uh, this was kind of an in certain areas. Um, we had this conversation, too, when OSHA, the OSHA vaccine mandate came down. And thankfully, um, Iowa, the day before the Supreme Court ruling, our Department of Labor um, workforce, Rod Roberts, issued a memo saying that they're not going to comply or enforce this federal mandate. Uh, thankfully, you know, the Supreme Court struck it down. But um, ultimately, that is kind of our line of defense is basically not complying and that there is no legal obligation for us to comply with uh, unconstitutional federal mandates or rules. And we have a lot of constitutional law to support us that there's no precedent for the for the federal government to be able to commandeer state resources for for their rules. So basically, you know, we're trying to find ways to draw lines in the sand. Um, the state of Iowa needs to exercise as much sovereign power um, because I mean, it's just so sad to see what's happening, um, you know, with just Ameri with, with just Amer the trajectory of America and, uh, you know, the international government that's forming. And I mean, we've really seen the system of federalism um, play itself out through COVID era. Anyway, so the Second Amendment Preservation Act, uh, we have 15 co-sponsors on that. Um, I want to say it's House File 147, I think is my guess. So Anyway, we're hoping to get a subcommittee hearing on that, and we're hoping basically to make sure that Iowa is not complicit uh, with federal tyranny, especially when it comes to our sacred Second Amendment rights. 
So are you looking, do you think you might get a subcommittee hearing yet this week on that? Uh, no, it wouldn't happen this week, but I think I need to talk to members of the committee and just see kind of where we're at and what the objections are. Um, the benefit I have is that this is already law in Missouri. So we're not even really in that much of uncharted territory. We're just kind of, um, lining up behind Missouri to make, again, just, um, you know, freedom shine in America's heartland. And the Second Amendment, as we saw uh, this last election, really is a value, an American value that that does cut across both parties. The Second Amendment on the Iowa ballot this year uh, got much higher, um, you know, exceeded, beat Mike Nag and Governor Reynolds and all those people. The Second Amendment led the the Iowa ticket um, in public support. So I think that's very significant that this is a good area to to start exerting. Um, again, basically, our just our constitutional duty to not comply with with federal edicts that violate our sacred rights. Um, that's really important. How can we support you in that? How can our members support you in that? Because that's a big concern of ours. Yeah. So it's been um, it's been referred to the Judiciary Committee. So uh, my next step is to uh, ref- is you know connect with the Judiciary Chairman. And there's a couple uh, legislation that's going through there, and there's a couple other things to talk about as well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be meeting with the Judiciary Chairman. I think these are conversations that need to happen. Um, so I would reach out to members of the Judiciary Committee. And um, and ask ask to get this on the schedule for a hearing, and ask them to prioritize it, and make sure that Iowa is never complicit with the dirty deeds of the federal government, because I think that would be very bad karma uh, for all of us. Um, but uh, yeah, and um, the other piece with that is, I think we have 15 co-sponsors, um, and sadly, I wasn't able to work the chamber as much as I wanted to, so I think I could have shook down some more. But definitely uh, reach out to your own representative as well, and make sure that they have an eye on the legislation. Uh, look up House File 147. Um, and I, I should have a lot more information on this coming out soon. I'm getting caught up on kind of my newsletter writing online activity too. But uh, so keep an eye out for it. And if you, one of your representatives or one of the ones who signed on to this, make sure to give them a big thank you note. Uh, again, for, you know, the state of Iowa is basically our line of defense against the federal government. And from what we're seeing from the federal government with the weaponization of law enforcement, the FBI, the Department of Justice, you know, going after pro life activists. Uh, wishing to impose very draconian mandates, um, y- you know, and who knows what the future holds. So basically just making sure we're exercising power and not giving an inch because we see where this is going and it's about time we say no. That's a big resounding no from us as well. We really appreciate that. And, and we- I don't even own guns, right? Like I don't even, I, I've been debating, you know, do I need, I want to really get chickens. And if I get chickens, I'll probably have to buy a shotgun or a rifle to keep them safe or whatever. But like, I'm not even like a big gun guy, but I mean, you know, but the constitution um, is, is worth defending. And I think this is great legislation. So I appreciate your interest in it. Definitely. We'll be checking that out and watching it and supporting you. And I'll definitely get the word out for emailing the judiciary committee. Hey, that'd be cool. We want to stay in contact with you on that and keep updated on it. Um, what else? Is there anything else this week? Um, no, I'm just waiting on some more bill drafts. Um, I think there's a lot of great conversations happening. I think, again, um, I mean, it's just so great to see the citizen driven activism and like the, the news cycle does kind of drive politics in a lot of ways. So just the fact that we had a great event on Thursday where we got a lot of earned media with the governor, with Governor Reynolds saying great things um, and really just, again, jumpstarts a lot of these discussions when we have those public town halls. So it's just really, really important that um, we are engaging and kind of, you know, we approach this as if we're having a conversation as an entire state. Therefore, we're having conversations with our friends and neighbors, our people at church, you know, our business associates, our customers even. Um, about, Hey, I mean, because these are, these are big picture things. And we haven't even started talking about, you know, the food supply or the MRNA scandal or, or climate change, international government there, or the war in Ukraine and, um, all the, you know, foreshadowing they have about world war three. I don't know. The whole thing's crazy, Oliver. Um, I'm very pro chicken. Um, I'm very pro, uh, freezer full of protein. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I got to figure out, how, I mean, anyway, we just got to figure out how to bolster our immune system. Um, yeah, I mean, cause yeah, anyway, we, yeah, we got a lot, a lot to work on. It's feeling very overwhelming, I guess, especially like when we had to sit through these meetings with, um, basically saying that school districts can't keep secrets from parents. 
which is just so absurd, right? Because the school districts, they want to be these like trusted institutions, yet as a matter of policy, they also want to keep secrets. It's like, I have no idea how they can have it both ways. But sitting through that room, like the human suffering is real. And I think the biggest thing that sticks out to me is, you know, we have so many adolescents now. And by adolescents, I mean, you know, grown children calling themselves adults or whatever as well. But um, they're really clamoring out and they've really fallen for these kind of um, pseudo identities or false identities and, and really are just playing into I don't know, it's just crying out for help in a way, but um, I mean, there's a lot of mental angst and anguish and, you know, people who, uh, you know, need loving support and are in a lot of kind of emotional pain. I think there's a lot of emotional pain. I certainly feel it when we talk about a lot of these school issues and just all the things we're seeing. And, um, and you know, you saw my remark on the school choice bill. So like, yeah, I mean, this is heavy stuff and we got to feel all this and process it. And um and hopefully come together and pray and ask for wisdom and guidance because, uh, you know, who knows what the future holds. But it, feel, it feels very heavy. You know, I've been feeling that. So I think that's the other thing I've been really appreciative. Like when Eddie Andrews came out and expressed all that joy and all that positivity and just uh, the love that was in that room on Thursday night. I mean, that's that's really, really important, too, that we consciously cultivate and create that in our communities because um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with all the things we're seeing. Yeah, that is important. It's important to bring our inner peace to this um, this process. Um, all we can do is what we can do. And then what happens after that, we don't have any control over. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, it's always a pleasure. And I hope that everyone found this informative. We'll be doing this every week with... Uh, either the same or a different legislator. So thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks so much. It's hey, always thanks, pleasure. Oliver. I yeah. appreciate you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you at the Capitol. Yeah. We'll see you at the Capitol. Until the next time, remember our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. Amen. Mm-hmm.